today. Today we're going to talk. Go ahead. <laughs> you go, because I'm just going to take me a couple of shots anyway. What do you got? You do it. Nothing. You want me to do the intro? Yeah, you do it this time. Let's see if you All can right. do it without laughing. Go. Well, today we're going to talk about Ted Bundy, a serial killer, 30 known victims so far. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, 30 confessions. They, God knows how many others, they think. And this is Dr. James Dobson, who ran a show and a, a, a foundation called Focus on the Family. He is a psychologist. He's also a conservative and an evangelical Christian. He had been in communication with Ted Bundy for a year before this thing is is um, recorded. So that's what you need to know. All right. We've all talked with Mark. <laughs> I got nothing. This is a message I want to get across. But as a young, a young boy, and I mean the boy of uh, 12 or 13, certainly, uh, that I encountered outside the home again uh, in um, the local grocery store, the local uh, uh, drugstore, the softcore pornography, what people call softcore. Um, but as I think I, I explained to you last night, Dr. Dobson, in an anecdote, that as young boys do, we explored the the back roads and sideways and byways of our neighborhood and oftentimes people would dump the garbage and whatever they were cleaning out of their house and from time to time we'd come across so oh, pornographic books of a harder nature than uh, more uh, graphic you might say more explicit nature than we would encounter let's say in your local grocery store and this also included such things as let's say detective magazines and uh, more hard Those that involve hard. violence. Yes, yes, yeah. and I, I, and this is something I think I want to emphasize is the, 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 the most damaging uh, uh, kinds of pornography. And my, again, I'm talking from personal experience, uh, hard, real personal experience. The most damaging kinds of pornography are those that involve violence uh, and sexual violence. Because the wedding of those two forces, as, as I know only too well, brings about behavior that is just, uh, mm. is just uh, too terrible to describe. No. All right, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, if you want to know how somebody secretly feels, ask them how they think most people feel about a certain issue. You'll get their truthful response. What we're seeing is that he thinks most people are like him. And we're seeing him kind of selling that. He uses the word we to describe antisocial behavior at the beginning here. We're going to see this come up again. And when with these critical moments, you can see how he was seen as charming. These eyebrow flashes to the interviewer at these key points. And when he wants to be self-deprecating in order to get you to like him. And he uses the term wedding to talk about violence and pornography coming together. And I think this is a key element here. This reveals more than if he would say something like joining or meaning or meeting those two things together. And this is a wedding he's referring to, a union of things that were destined to be together or maybe a joining of two things that should always be together. And I think that's what we're really hearing. And each one of these videos, I'm going to share with you a fun fact about this, uh, some research that was done at the University of Kentucky, which is the largest research project on Ted Bundy. So according to these clinical and forensic psychologists, the one of the leads was named Daryl Turner, Dr. Daryl Turner. Ted Bundy is basically the textbook definition of a prototypical psychopath, in, end quote. Greg, what do you got? I'm yeah, laughing. So I'm sorry because you said fun fact about psychopaths. Sorry, dude. That, that totally well, you talk me about you talk about psychopaths all the time, so it's fun. That's yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. God. You want to hand it off? You want to just go from there? No, go ahead. Okay, good. Go ahead. Yeah. So, guys, here's the thing, Chase. I'm with you. What we project onto other people is what we want them to be, or what we perceive ourselves to be in those cases. And you see a little bit of that here. This doc, this doctor is talking to him and looking for reasons why this monster was created. And this, he's gonna certainly give him that. What we're watching is a master manipulator at work. And this is probably my favorite of all the things I've seen on Ted Bundy. The only reason we did it is because this is so masterful. What we're seeing here is a psychopath at work in the same way he would work someone before he caved their head in with a stick or whatever he did to all these people. And he just doesn't get that opportunity because he's caged and his fangs are removed. So we get to watch him right here 
be exactly who he is, and he's doing it exactly that. Watch as he talks. When he pontificates, and he's here to pontificate, make no mistake, he needs to still be pertinent and still be somebody who matters because he is a horrific narcissist. You're going to see it all through this whole thing. We'll listen for language, and we'll point it out. He starts off, I love Chase is using your closed eye talking. Well, it's good for the environment as he's pontificating. Every time he pontificates, he closes his eyes and does that closed eye talking. And then when he wants to make a point about the story he wants this guy to buy, locked eye contact and brow up. Those are his key points in every story. There's also a lot of tongue jutting. So let's start looking at tongue jutting to see if it means anything or is it a pattern for him throughout this whole thing. And you'll see that he has a tail that he's trying to get out here as he goes through. Everything he's gonna talk about is gonna be grand. It's the reason he uses words like wedding, the reason he uses these complex words because narcissists don't want anything to be normal in their life. Their friends are cooler and faster and prettier. Everybody they don't know is smarter and they use self-aggrandizing language. And you're gonna see a lot of that as we go through here. And then when he starts talking about, oh, he does one of my favorite things that I haven't ever seen anybody do but him and maybe Casey Anthony. And that's this, pop his eyes really big and look under his brows and pull his head back. It is such a weird look. And he does that every time he's trying to get something. At the very close of the video, I'll cut this short, At the very close of the video, stop and look. There's absolute disdain in that guy's face for the guy he's talking to. This is a piece of work. This is a wild animal in a cage. Thank God they found the cure for him and they cured him the next day. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm gonna say this. We're going to see two master manipulators. We're going to see somebody selling a lie on purpose and another person buying a lie on purpose. And I think that's for me is what is most exciting about this is we're going to see somebody spinning and the other person using that spin for their purposes as well. But we'll get to that. Um, look, there's a lovely, a lovely set of tongue juts there. Uh, but I think we're going to have to discount those all the way along because it's repetitive behavior. And also, we've got to understand that uh, along with this kind of what I would call gentlemanly behavior, we're always going to see this through the lens of Hannibal Lecter, I think. So when we, when we see these things, we're going to see behaviors that we think we recognize as those of the psychopath. But that's simply because I think art has taken these and and ramped the volume up on them. So just take that as, as context. Uh, we're, we're always viewing this through somebody's performance of the quintessential psychopath anyway. Um, okay, what I love about his imagery here is he's saying he's the product of people throwing out trash, just as you say, uh, the, 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 the wedding of two forces, violence and sex. But those two things coming together is what people have thrown out in the, in the back rows, the sideways and the highways. So that's kind of it. So often you'll find that the geography, we call it psychogeography, that the geography of a landscape or a home will have a, um, a correlation to the psychology of a person, or at least that is some traditional psychogeography. And we're going to see him use these ideas throughout. Now, why is that? Either he's incredibly up on his current psychology of the time, or he's a fully integrated human being, or he knows that's what the interviewer is looking for. That's what this interviewer will will buy from him and actually wants to buy from him. We'll come to more of that later on, but just want to put that in your mind that they, he's already planted this idea of an understanding of the way the human mind might work and also the way society might work and how somebody might be manipulated unwittingly by the by society's own trash to become that trash in in our minds. Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. I think we're seeing, like Greg was saying, y'all, everybody's nailed stuff on this. We're, we're watching a psychopath be a psychopath. You're going to have certain feelings when you go through here. 
when you when you watch this guy and, and listen to him and talk to him, you look at him and you look at him watching this guy and the way he uses the words he describes what happened. Some of you all are going to feel like he might be OK. You know, it wasn't that bad because, you know, all people are, you know, basically good. That's what you're going to think. You know, that's what that's that feeling you're going to get in here. So if you're wondering how they do it, this is how they do it. You're watching it happen and it just gets better and better. And it seems a little boring as we go along, right? Because he's talking real low and all that. No, man, this is a psychopath doing what a psychopath does. And he would do it to you, too. Keep in mind, this guy's a monster. He cut people's heads off. Didn't know that, did you? Cut, he cut some of these people's heads off and did weird things with it. And that with that situation happening there, I've got to be can't be too graphic. So that's what we're seeing there. We're seeing a psychopath be a psychopath. Greg's the first one to say that. All right. We're seeing a severity softening. He starts talking about it like it was long ago. Then when he was a kid, this problem happened and all that. That strong eye contact, he's trying to to gain his trust with him because the guy's there trying to find out, find out what happened to him and why he's like this. And he's telling him what he thinks he wants him to hear or what he wants him to hear. So there's it's the, the that huge guarding of the ego. That's what the psychopath is doing. You, you have to really be careful with the ego. So that's what he's doing. He's guarding the ego because this isn't his fault, man. No, it's not his fault. There's something else that's the fault. What's well, fault? It was pornography. That's what did it to him. So that's what he starts blaming everything on. And it just goes throughout the whole the whole set of stuff we're watching. His voice tone, his cadence, everything's very smooth. He's got that low voice going. He talks to him and he looks away. And as he looks away, he puts this pleasant look on his face, this kind of smiley looking face, because he's allowing him to look at him and watch him be a good person and explain what's happening, what his problem is. So he's allowing him to watch that and watch him be that person. Oh, this is great stuff. This is classic stuff. Then he watch throughout these videos as well. He keeps breaking the contact with this guy to see what's happening over here on the other side of the room. Something's going on. It must be a doorway or something. People coming out in and out. But he's alert. He's on alert for that. He keeps watching that. So his brain is on alert for things to happen. So he's clicking back into that animalistic part of him. But this is this is great. It's just going to get better as we go along. And I'm I'm really excited about this as I, as I know you guys are too. Okay, we're good. Yeah, let's move. This is a message I want to get across. But as a young a young boy, and I mean the boy of. Uh, 12 or 13 certainly uh, that I encountered outside the home again uh, in um, the local grocery store or the local uh, uh, drugstore the softcore pornography what people call softcore um, but as I think I, I explained to you last night Dr. Dobson in an anecdote uh, that as young boys do we explored the the back roads and sideways and byways of our neighborhood and oftentimes people would dump the garbage and whatever they were cleaning out of their house and from time to time we'd come across so oh, pornographic books of a harder nature than uh, more uh, graphic you might say more explicit nature than we would encounter let's say in your local grocery store and this also included such things as let's say detective magazines and uh, more hard those that involve violence. violence yes yes yeah. and I, I and this is something I think I want to emphasize is the the, the, the most damaging um, uh, kinds of pornography and my again I'm talking from personal experience uh, hard real personal experience the most damaging kinds of pornography are those that involve violence uh, and sexual violence because the wedding of those two forces, as, as I know only too well, brings about behavior that is just, uh, mm. is just uh, too terrible to describe. Now, describe. now, walk me through that. What was going on in your mind at that time? Okay, before we go any further, I think I mean, it's important to me and, uh, and the people, the people believe what I'm saying to tell you that that I'm not blaming pornography and not saying that it caused me to go out and do certain things and I take full responsibility for whatever I've done and all the things that I've done that's not the question here the question and, and, and the issue is how this kind of literature contributed and helped mold and, and shape the kinds of violent behavior it fueled your fantasies fueled, though. well in in the beginning it fuels this kind of thought process 
then it, at a certain time it's instrumental in what I would say crystallizing it, make it in, making it into something which is almost an, like a separate entity inside. And that in, at that point you're at the verge, or I was at the verge of acting out on this on this kind of these kinds of things. Really- uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, lovely. Okay, so he uses the metaphor there of crystallizing the personality. That's really nice. So there's the idea of personalities being almost like crystallized facets. That's not something that he's suddenly come up with, that metaphor. That's that's a quite a common metaphor in the persona metaphor that many psychologists at that time might well be adhering to. So at this point, I start to wonder, to, by, by the way, I've never met this guy before. I've never seen any video of him or the guy he's talking to. I understand a little bit, but not very much about his kind of his legend, but really nothing. But I start to think, why is he so up on his psychology here? Um, Because he really is quite up. What you have to do in in that model is integrate those facets. If you integrate those facets, we have different elements of our personality. And if one element doesn't know the other element is there, especially if one of those elements is quite dark and dangerous, then there's trouble. And he's really got a very good understanding of that at the time. So I start to think, who's he talking to? Who's he talking to? Why Why has he come up with this idea for this particular moment? Because I, because me, with a bit of understanding of that analyst point of view, I start to go, well, he's saying all the right stuff to make somebody like me go, he's either a fully integrated, you know, spent 10 years from my understanding inside, either he's now fully integrated his personality and he totally understands and you know maybe we should should you know think about parole for this guy or certainly you know he's maybe mm-hmm. worth a bit of a repeat preve because he's he's fully integrated himself so um uh why am i starting to think that because is he playing me because if he's playing me he's not doing a bad job of it like he's doing a pretty good job of playing me. Now, what he's not doing, because I don't hold the same values, his moral crusade piece isn't really hitting home with me very well. So then I start to go, oh, he's not playing me, so who is he playing? There's only one other person in the room. Uh, Is that, I start to go, is that person a doctor? Is that person a psychologist? Is that person some kind of moral crusader? Because both of those would work quite well. Anyway. Good, good play because he's got his vocabulary really well on both of those, both both on the psychology uh, standpoint and on the morality moral crusade standpoint. Really good job by him. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so I'm going to take it down a little different path, but the same thing because he is using language of a psychologist everywhere you turn. But what I think he's doing is starting to weave his werewolf story. I said cat people have you ever seen that movie i wake up and horrible things have happened this is what he's doing he's starting to say look it's not me it's the entity it's the entity oh it's the entity that's handy that's what i'm going to say next time i get pulled over for speeding i'm going to say i can't help it it was the entity it got this car it made me drive fat you know that's all he's starting down that path i agree with him mark he says out loud what he is thinking for change he says it's important to me that people believe what i have to say and when he does that he goes to a modified steepling and that's power authority and he's doing the that's burns from you know from from the simpsons excellent you see him doing that but he's got amusement in his face now he also has a he has a snarky kind of a little smile naturally a little smirk but look at his face it's not this, this it's all of this in the center he's smiling his eyes are even smiling his lower face isn't so he's amused himself somehow and then he goes into that worm on a griddle movement thing as he starts talking and trying to work out what he should say. And he's working around not blaming. And you see him when he hits, hits key points to the story, and Mark, he starts to talk. Just so you can tell this is some psychology from, from prison. I need to take responsibility. There's his key point again. He's making those points. The tongue jot comes out at question here. And Mark, I'm with you. We see so many tongue jots that if it's distaste, then we got a problem. Um, This is just getting you to follow down his path to believe what he believes. When he says, when Dobson says, it fueled your fantasies, 
you see disapproval in his face because he's trying to get a different message than that across that there's some other entity, there's some other thing. And then he, you even see a little engagement of the grief muscle and pursed lips as he's pushing that away. He's got to get across his key point. There's something else other than him. He illustrates with both hands and he changes his cadence and he slows his it. It was instrumental. And I think Mark, you're dead on. He's trying to, pr he's been talking to this guy for a year. If you talk to a psychopath for a year, they know more about you than you know about you because they don't have any thoughts of their own that are normal humans. So they, they need to understand what you're doing. And Scott, I'm sure somewhere in here, we'll find out a little bit about sweet and sour chicken and how much they like it because that's an important part of what we're seeing here. And then my, this is part of the starting to be the darkest part. When Dobson actually says something, when he says, you've gone as far as you can, you see him put his hands up in a regulator. You got it. You got it. He goes, mm-hmm. You had gone about as far as you could go in your own fantasy life mm -hmm. with... That spider to the fly right there. Come on in. It'll be nice. Scott, what do you got? All right, we're seeing matching and mirroring here. And if you listen to the way to the way Bundy's talking, listen to the way the other guy's talking, they slowly begin to to sound a lot alike. Listen to the words Bundy uses. They're really uh, these these jagged um, descriptive words that are really long words. The other guy's using these really simple short words. Now, Bundy does keep up with the with the long jagged words throughout because he's got points to make, and that's the way he makes those points. He's those words, so it sounds something. Um, very intellectual that we're, you know, is the reason that he's the way he is. But listen to how they start matching up and how the, how the cadence starts matching up as well. And watch the way he's sitting compared to the way the, the, uh, the interviewer is sitting because he starts doing the exact same thing this guy is doing. When he starts working with his hands like this, he, he may open up a couple of times with his hands like that as well. But he does keep, I think you're right, Greg, he keeps that Stiefland situation happening. That's really, really important. So let's pay attention to how he's matching and mirroring what he's seeing and hearing from this guy, uh, especially toward the end there, because, it, man, it gets good. Uh, Chase, what do you got? So when he's saying I'm taking responsibility, this is kind of self-deprecating. And right here you see an eyebrow flash. And if you go through all of this and just, just pick out key moments of where the eyebrows are going up, this is during some kind of admission or self-deprecating talk. And he's continuing uh, during all of these key points in this video to do this exact same things. All the ones we're going to see in the future, you'll see these little spikes and eyebrow flash during those key moments. This is a highly, highly intelligent guy. And this is what they call a successful psychopath because they're leveraging their capacity to use people uh, as effectively as possible. This downward eye gaze is kind of an internal dialogue spot an emotional dialogue spot where we might see. Uh, you'll see this in highly charismatic people that they actually make less eye contact, then make strong, powerful eye contact at key moments. You'll see Bill Clinton do this. You'll see George Bush. You'll see Barack Obama do this. You'll see Tom Cruise do this a lot. Uh, and at the end, you can see this kind of scandal face here when he's talking about reaching a limit. You can see the Anthony Weiner scandal face uh, right there. As our fact for this, uh, this clip, about 95% of the psychologists at the University of Kentucky study believe that Ted Bundy also showed signs of narcissistic personality disorder, which we are very familiar with if you're a subscriber to the channel. Now, walk me through that. What was going on in your mind at that time? Okay, before we go any further, I think I mean, it's important to me and, uh, and the people the people believe what I'm saying to tell you that that I'm not blaming pornography and not saying that it caused me to go out and do certain things and I take full responsibility for whatever I've done and all the things that I've done that's not the question here the question and, and, and the issue is how this kind of literature contributed and helped mold and, and shape the kinds of violent behavior. It fueled your fantasies. Fueled. Though. Well, in, in the beginning, it fuels this kind of thought process. Then, it, at a certain time, it's instrumental in what I would say crystallizing it, make it in, making it into something which is almost an, like a separate entity inside. And that in, at that point, you're at the verge, or I was at the verge of acting out on this on this kind of these kinds of thoughts. Now, out on this on this kind of 
these kinds of things. Now, I really want to understand that. You had gone about as far as you could go in your own fantasy life mm -hmm. with printed material. And you made or printed and video or film. Photo, or film, photos, magazines, yeah. what have you. Yeah. And, and then there was the urge to take that little step or big step over to a physical right. uh, event. And it happens... It, it happened in stages, gradually. It doesn't necessarily, not to me at least, happen overnight. My experience with, I say pornography generally, but with pornography that deals on a violent level with the sexuality, um, is that once you become addicted to it, and I look at this as a kind of addiction, uh, like other kinds of addiction, of addiction you keep, I would keep looking for more potent, more explicit, yeah, more graphic aggressive. kinds of material. Like an addiction, you keep craving something which is harder, harder, something which which gives you a greater uh, sense of, uh, of, of uh, excitement. Until you reach the point where the pornography only goes so far. You reach the, that jumping off point where you begin to wonder if, if maybe actually doing it will give you that which is beyond just reading about it or looking at it. How long? All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, at printed material, he does a couple of things that make me want to dig in. Um, he goes, does an in-breath of apprehension, like he's going to ask something a little further. And then he says, and his blink rate increases, which is uncharacteristic for him. So something's going on. And when he says printed material, he goes down some path and says, and other and what have you. Well, hold on, hold on. That's a lead. That is a lead. When a person says, and what have you, you know, we always say intelligence hates ambiguity. You would ask, even though you might not want to know the answer in this case, you would ask, what other things did you do? Because you're probably going to find there's something more in here than what he's letting on because he has apprehension. He has a blink rate that increases and he shows some disdain. He pulls those sides of his mouth back, not just a lip compression, but a pull back. He does that tongue jut again. Mark, I'm with you. This is just what he does. Then he starts to pontificate. Here's the thing. I'll call him KP. I got it written down the same thing. Chase, we're talking about key points, sexuality and addiction. Front of mouth talking a little bit. Scotty does your fading facts as he's telling you to drift off the end. And this is, he then tries to get his point across. I look at this as a point of addiction. He's working this guy. He knows what this guy wants to hear and he's feeding him exactly that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I think that's why you get that intake of breath on, um, on just published materials because he wants the interviewer to bring up the idea of video and cable as well because, um, because that's the bigger hit here. That's the, that's the real target here. That's how both of them can leave their mark on this. He knows it and the interviewer knows it, it's just the interviewer hasn't quite latched on to the, the way that they're both gonna go on this one. He will do eventually, he'll help him out in the end, uh, sort out what the, the biggest target is for both of them. But at this point we have, look, he's pushing all the right buttons, he's throwing all the right switches here because we've got addiction to the thrill. Now that is true for the psychopath is there's an addiction, there is a, a need for bigger and bigger and bigger uh, uh, boosts of, ad of adrenaline, uh, but also it pulls that switch on addiction. Uh, we're at the time here of Reagan, of Nancy Reagan, of Just Say No, of one of the biggest threats to, um, to conservative America is drugs. And so this person is addicted. They are a result of, of this, um, this terrible social drug situation. So this is not a perpetrator. He's now put himself in the victim role because he is a, an addict. Um, but no mention at all of the, uh, of the victims at all, nothing so far. I haven't heard a victim mentioned at all. So at the same time as him having this gentlemanly scholar air around him, which is a lovely kind of trope of, uh, of crime throughout history of the very, the highly social, antisocial person. It's the Pink Panther, essentially the gentleman thief. It's just here we have uh, the gentleman um, psychopath, uh, extreme 
uh, abusive murderer. I mean, it's just one of the one of the most extreme examples. But then portraying this gentleman attitude on us at the same time, it's a beautiful play. It's exactly what we want as a TV watching public as a video watching public he's giving us the exact two extremes that we want it's exactly what sir anthony hopkins made hannibal lecter out of he's a gentleman and he's an extreme psychological scholar at the same time it's exactly what the audience want to see to have what we call an allotropic response which is you want to lean in and look and at the same time you just can't look the two things are playing at the same time highly entertaining um but is he really this gentleman's scholar or is he just cold well, we, we know what he is in the end, but we know what he's trying to play here. And I just want you to keep noticing how this interviewer is, is a little more complicit than he's being played. Or certainly he is, the lie being told is a useful lie for this particular interviewer. And again, we'll see that play out. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? I think he gets lost in there. I think you're seeing a little bit of that that panic on him. I think is the the uh, part of what we're seeing is getting lost because he's got a lot he wants to say. He's got tons of stuff he wants to make sure he gets a specific point ac across. When he starts going down that that part where you're talking about, Greg, where he's, we see his blink rate go up, and Mark, we're talking about where things get kind of he gets kind of boxed in there. I think he gets lost and, and loses his train of thought in there. I think that's what that is because he's trying. He's he's thinking about two things at once. It's hard to keep two different things happening in your mind at the same time. Two two separate thoughts. So he's trying to keep this guy on point as he charms him. And he's trying to get his point across at the same time. So go along with that Ridley Stroop um, experiment. It's tough to keep two things going at once. So I think that's what we're seeing there is that that fight for one thought as it goes, trying to meld them into one. So I think he got lost a little bit. And that's where the uh, some of the panic is coming, not panic, but some of the stress is, is coming from that. He's still trying to keep things clinical and make it sound like he's just uh, you're right, Mark. He's just he's this guy doing this. But there's this clinical thing going on with it because he's he's fine. Nothing wrong with this guy. And you're seeing him be that gentleman because that's his charming part. He's trying to charm the pants off this guy and everybody else too. But like you said earlier, Greg, that's what happens. They they do that to you, and the next thing you know, they go, "What's that over there, man? Is that is that yours?" And you look over there, and you get clonked in the head, and then who knows what's going to happen after that. So I don't know. I think this is getting more exciting as it goes. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, if if he is trying to do something and the other guy is not really following along, not really picking up on it. I'd say that might be an inspector Clouseau uh, moment right there to go with your pink Panther metaphor. But we saw it one time in the last video and we're seeing it again here. You can hear him using the word you to talk about the journey that he took to becoming a, a serial killer. He corrects it this time and he owns it. So he corrects himself. And now toward the end of this clip, you can hear him transition to no longer talking about himself at all. He is fully distanced from this behavior, wanting to socialize it with a shift in the pronoun. Everything is about you, 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 you get this, you get this. This is what uh, pornography does to you. Everything's about someone else and about the person listening. But he, again, he's making these eye contact at these critical points, uh, just like highly charismatic politicians do, spending almost all of his time looking away to this, to this down to his right. Uh, and let's talk about Dorothy O. Lewis, who's an MD. She's a psychiatrist from the New York University Medical Center who specializes in evaluating violent offenders. She actually tried to save Bundy from death row with the argument being that he suffered from bipolar personality disorder and that he shouldn't be in jail because of that. I'll leave that to you. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. Out on this, on this kind of, these kinds of things. I really want to understand that. You had gone about as far as you could go in your own fantasy life mm -hmm. with printed material and you made or printed and video or film Photo, or film photos, magazines yeah. what have you yeah. and and then there was the urge to take that little step or big step over to a physical right. uh, event and it happens 
it, it happened in stages, gradually. It doesn't necessarily, not to me at least, happen overnight. My experience with, I say, pornography generally, but with pornography that deals on a violent level with the sexuality, um, is that once you become addicted to it, and I look at this as a kind of addiction, uh, like other kinds of addiction, of addiction, you keep. I would keep looking for more potent, more explicit, yeah. more graphic kinds of material. Like an addiction, you keep craving something which is harder, harder. Something which which gives you a greater uh, sense of, uh, of, of uh, excitement. Until you reach the point where the pornography only goes so far. You reach that jumping off point where you begin to wonder if if maybe actually doing it will give you that which is beyond just reading about it or looking at it. How long? Reading about it or looking at it. How long did you stay at that point before you actually assaulted someone? Well, yeah, you see, that is a very delicate point in my own development. And we're talking about something, we're talking about having reached a point or a, a, a gray area that surrounded that point over a course of years. You don't remember years. how long that well, was? Well, I, I would say, I would say a couple years. And what was I was dealing with there were very strong inhibitions against criminal behavior or violent behavior that had been conditioned into me, bred into me, in my environment, in my neighborhood, in my church, uh, in my school. Things which said, no, this is wrong. I mean, this, I mean even to think of it is wrong, but it, certainly to do it is wrong. And you're on, well, I'm on that edge in these, the last, the, the, you might say, the last vestiges of restraint. Uh, the barriers to actually doing something were being tested constantly and assault, uh, assailed um, through the kind of fantasy life that was fueled largely by pornography do you remember okay chase what do you got yeah it makes some uh, pretty strong eye contact again right when he's mentioning church and school he gives this big list but just makes eye contact when he's talking about i go to church and i went to school and he wants you to know that and he corrects his pronoun shift again here when he says you're on that edge and he, then he says i'm on that edge and when he's saying this is largely fueled by Pornography. There's a huge eyebrow flash for approval here to the interviewer. His cadence here is different than any other time that he's really spoken, which is few. That there's not a whole lot of video audio of him out there, but it's turned into this clinical sterility of a doctor explaining something complex to a patient who doesn't get it. And he's essentially building this in a way where he's not saying it directly but letting you feel clever for tying the two things together. Like the, all of this is the reason for those murders. And it's kind of like when you watch the news and they talk about a woman being killed, but earlier her and her boyfriend were seen shouting at each other. They don't tie it together. They get to make you feel clever for tying those two things together. So you're more likely to watch the show later that evening. So Let's go back to the University of Kentucky real quick. The majority of that same group of uh, about 100 psychologists and psychiatrists in this University of Kentucky study said that Bundy was above the diagnostic threshold for a borderline. The, the borderline personality disorder affects anywhere between uh, 2 to 6% of the United States population. And people with uh, borderline tend to feel emotions intensely which may be why not all of the psychologists felt that Bundy fell into this category of mental health illness. Scott, what do you got? All right. This made him uncomfortable getting in there because from what he's talking about. So he has to take a minute. That's why you hear that throat clearing and all that, because it sort of brings everything to a halt. And he's got to think about, oh, gosh, got to get this set this up and deliver this right. Uh, so that's for the for all the little things we see, we see in there that let us know that he's being that he's uncomfortable. Um, this is the question he was waiting on. He's been waiting to, to, to make his point from that question at this point. So he wasn't ready for it. And it caught him off guard. And this, this one's going to be short because I got so much to go here in a little while. I'm going to start making my little bit short from right here. Um, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So uh, there's a real rhythm change here from 
how direct he was before to how indirect he is. In fact, I, it isn't really until he lands the end of that sentence, um, that right at the end of that clip, that any of it really makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of kind of word salad in there. So I think, yeah, he's he is he is failing to find the same persona to 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 illustrate or describe being closer to his acts of sexual violence. I think that's where the question was going is, to, is, is the question is, is getting closer to one of those acts or a first act. And as he gets closer to that act or first act, he doesn't have the erudite wordsmithing that he had because he's getting closer to the actual feelings that come over him during that, which he doesn't have words to describe. He has no, as we often don't, we don't have, you know, often we don't have words to describe even our mildest feelings. Think about the kinds of emotions that are going through somebody who's committing acts at his level. How do you describe that? And how do you describe that if your whole story is one of this is actually a clinical thing based around conditioning, based around genetics, based around clinical persona theory? He set up this whole idea of this is a bunch of psychology going on that I understand very well. And you, my specific audience in front of me, the interviewer, you could totally understand why this happens in this way the psychological medical reasoning for this he's lost reasoning because you probably don't have a great deal of social reasoning for doing what he did so he's totally in the dark right now i would suggest which is why he can't form sentences but he gets back on message because he really uh lands it uh in the pornography right at the end so he's back in there and he's back entirely with what will connect best with the Christian right at that point. So I'm getting the sense that his mark here is a is not just this person in front of him, but a whole section of society. He's marked them out as the target for his uh, for this interview because there's something instrumental that he wants them to do. And this interviewer is the conduit for that action. At this point, I'm not quite sure what it is, but I come a little surer later on. And the interviewer would like it as well. So the interviewer is going to come more complicit as we go along on this. But I love how he loses all sense at this point he doesn't have a description as he gets closer to the act uh greg what do you got on this one yeah mark i think we're going to see a lot later of his inability to describe how that feels but show it'll show in him what i think here is this is exactly what made him successful as a predator and because he can be fallible and human you see it here whether that's intentional i don't know but there's at least one or two indicators that i think he actually is intentionally stumbling through words so that he can redirect the conversation and keep it about the problem not about him we know that he faked arm injury had a fake cast to lure one woman in at least and maybe many others so that he uses weakness as that frailty that human frailty as a way to get other people's sympathy I, I think this is a clear demonstration of what made this organism successful and he's just doing it again when he does his key points chase i'm with you if we turn off all the sound and watch through here and see this will have every key point to the story he wants you to believe. Now, when he does the taffy drawing, taffy pulling with his eyes, that's even more profound. And he does that in this one. When he's asked the question and he wants to redirect, Dobson is trying to take him down the path of tell me about what happened the first time. And he didn't want to go there. So he uses filler words and he pontificates and redirects instead of chaff and redirects. And he clears his voice with, <clears throat> I think this is him doing it. He avoids the question entirely and then gets back to his point of being able to talk. If you don't believe he's doing something, pay attention to his cadence. It slows at against criminal behavior, hard eye contact. Uh, then he goes to, he's talking about church. And when he does that church, he makes really hard eye contact again and his cadence is down, his brow is up. Then he uses words again, words that average people, Scott, I'm surprised you didn't say, real people don't talk like that. The last vestiges 
of whatever you know he had there. He does hard eye contact again. Then he stumbles over the words assault, assail. I think he that's a legitimate mistake on his part because you can see displeasure in his face when he does it. And then he does another source lead that I would crawl all over when he says the fantasy life that was fueled largely, largely by porn. Hmm, largely. What does that mean? What else fueled it? What else caused that? And he, after he says pornography, he does a tongue jet. We don't think that means anything, but he also does a lip compression. When you have that much deviation, I would lean into that last sentence really hard to try to figure out, well, if it was largely fueled by that, what else caused it? And that's what I got. Reading about it or looking at it. How long did you stay at that point before you actually assaulted someone? Well, yeah, you see, that is a very delicate point in my own development. And we're talking about something, we're talking about having reached a point or a, a, a gray area that surrounded that point over a course of years. You don't remember years. how long that was? Well, I, I would say, I would say a couple years. And what was I was dealing with there were very strong inhibitions against criminal behavior or violent behavior that had been conditioned into me, bred into me, in my environment, in my neighborhood, in my church, uh, in my school. Um, things which said, no, this is wrong. I mean, this, I mean even to think of it as wrong, but it, certainly to do it is wrong. And you're on, well, I'm on that edge in these, the last, the, the, you might say, the last vestiges of restraint. Uh, the barriers to actually doing something were being tested constantly and assault uh, assailed um, through the kind of fantasy life that was fueled largely by pornography. Do you remember by pornography? Do you remember what pushed you over that edge? Do you remember well, the decision to go for it? Do you remember where you decided to throw caution to the wind? Again, when you say pushed, I don't. I, I know what you're saying. I don't want to yes, infer again. I, I understand that. That, that I was that, 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 that I was clear. some helpless yeah. kind of a victim, and yet uh, we're talking about an influence, which that is the influence of violent types of media and violent pornography, which had an, was, was an indispensable link in the chain of behavior, the chain of events that led to the behaviors, to the, to the assaults, to the murders, and what, and what have you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to describe. Uh, uh, the, the sensation of the the, 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 uh, of, of reaching that point where, you, where I knew that it, it was like something had, say, snapped, that I knew that, uh, that I couldn't control it anymore, that these barriers that, that I had, had been, uh, I had learned as a child uh, that had been instilled in me were not enough to hold me back with respect to seeking out and, and harming somebody. Would it be? Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I always say that when people are using charisma on you, there's a process to it. So they start off by demonstrating value. He clearly has that. He's the craziest psychopath on earth. <laughs> then they get, eventually get you down to where you belong. You create some kind of belonging with them and then let you differentiate yourself. He's creating belonging with this guy. He's working this guy pretty hard right now. Now, the guy is aware of it, and that's clear. But he's starting to differentiate him as well. He's starting to say, hey, you get it, and nobody else does. You can see it in the body language. When he starts off, you see him with that brow ridge up, like, are you getting this? This is different from the other times he's doing. He has his head kind of tilted and his brow up, like, are you getting what we're doing? That and that slight amusement is, yep, here you are. Here's what's interesting for me. It's really hard for a hardcore narcissist to ever say, I'm stupid, I'm this, I'm that. They just don't do it because they know that the minute they let that monster out of the cage, they got a problem. What we see here in him is some real dissonance, some real dissonance, because he says, uh, what words did he use exactly? Something about, and that's when you no longer could control. And then he's, he has a hell of a time trying to let that pass. He does that face of rejection. He says, it looks like he's almost saying, well, I wouldn't characterize it that way. He's got distaste in his mouth, concern in his brow, and cast his head away. That to me is him trying to figure out how do I take this next step? And then he puts his prayerful hands up, makes hard eye contact. 
here we are. Now he's got to figure a way to talk his way out of this. And it's the only time we see him starting to kind of do that wiggle, wiggle, wiggle in the chair. It tells me something's going on inside his head. Now, Mark, this is creep. This is creepy stuff right here. When you talk about what feeling does the person have, and he's reliving something right here is my guess. There's a whole lot of internal stuff going on, a lot of that mouth thing. When I see all that, I don't want to know what he's thinking, but I probably would have said, so what's going on in there now? My guess is he's reliving some of whatever joy he got from that horror, and you just don't want to hear about it. Chase, what do you got? I, you know, he goes to great lengths throughout this whole interview to protect his family uh, from negative attention, which I actually think is pretty noble for a psychopath to be doing, or at least uncommon uh, to be to be doing. But he's describing this feeling of being on the edge and his hands are out at a stop at the very beginning of this. And then he pulls it into himself like he's rescuing a baby and he's embracing this feeling. You can see him kind of pulling this in and, and holding it. You can see his shoulders go up and he's talking about the barriers he learned as a child. There's another eyebrow flash for acceptance. And it's kind of all I have here. Uh, but let's go back to the University of Kentucky really quick. More than 50 percent of the psychologists at the study labeled Bundy as having schizoid personality disorder or SPD, which you can think of as antisocial personality disorder to the extreme. And somebody with SPD has a, a kind of a lifelong pattern of indifference to other people and social isolation. And even though uh, schizoids kind of sounds like schizophrenia, they're very different. A person with uh, SPD is in touch with reality and makes sense when they speak, which Bundy, as intelligent as he was, absolutely did, which we can see in this video here. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So uh, he wants to, uh, doesn't want to shift blame, doesn't want to shift blame, and then immediately shifts it to pornography. Okay, I, 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 I get that. But the interviewer doesn't call him out on that. So, you know, it takes two people to lie, one to lie and the other to accept the lie. And here we have somebody who shouldn't have to accept that lie, but they're going down the route of accepting it. So that causes alarm bells in me as why do you not want to call him out on this idea of pornography? Why do you want him to let him shift that blame at that point when any reasonable person watching this, knowing the legend of his background is going to go, you can't shift that responsibility. You yourself said it's all your responsibility. And then you shifted immediately. That that begs belief. But we both are complicit now in taking us into what is, from my point of view, a quite unbelievable world for both of them. He then goes to then he could not hold it back. So now he's created, Greg, as you said earlier on, he's created the other entity in there. Now, again, that's that idea of the outside entity, the, the, the thing that possesses you it, at this point in history has started to become a popular cultural norm. And so we as the TV viewing public, uh, you know, if we're watching cable TV, uh, that's, that's a norm that we have, that there is the possibility, the fantasy there that you can be overcome by something external to yourself, a part of your personality or, or an outside entity, some kind of alien that, that takes you over. He's starting to tell that kind of story. Again, he's not, he's not, the interviewer doesn't pick up on that and say, well, no, hang on. Surely it was you. You did this. Doesn't pick up on that at all. Um, what interests me most about this is that for somebody again who was quite erudite, and I get Greg that he that he may be playing this stumbling on purpose, but I think you're also right that here is the point where the act is a tangible thing in front of him, full of uh, feelings for him, which his personality would not be used to being able to mediate. He has no way of describing these things. He has no way of controlling them. And they and, and, and we, though we may have 
many of the same feelings and the extremes when they come we have mediators in that we've been told by our parents and by and by many cultural entities around us um and maybe we just haven't had access to the uh to the extreme pornography that he that turned him into the monster that he is and means he doesn't have these mediators but certainly what's interesting for me is for somebody who has been so erudite about psychology and psychoanalysis at this point he is devoid of description which again means we're probably more into the truth here and the truth of he has no real understanding of the psychology at all he is not integrated in any way and there is something i don't know how to describe it but of an a less an inhuman or what we might feel to be uh inhuman passions in him behaviors which he cannot control he can't even describe and the acts that come out of that are in uh, unseeable and indescribable by most sane human beings he he doesn't even know what it is yeah uh, it's that for me is not an act he doesn't know what he's really got in front of him right now scott what do you got on this one yeah i'm not gonna go that deep i think he's trying to get his point across here this is really important that he gets the point across here that this isn't his fault again going back to the same story he's weaving throughout this whole thing then he has that painful look and all that then he flips right back to normal there's a flat affect as he looks at the at, at uh the interviewer what's the interviewer's name greg what the, what's this guy dobson dr James dobson. dobson yeah yeah i always call him the interviewer uh as he looks right back at him so that just that shows us exactly he's just reset he's nothing has changed he's staying right there trying to get his point across and all that uh he knows he he's familiar with emotions and what they look like he just doesn't know the intricacies of making that happen so it looks real so that's why it's starting to look odd a lot of people are starting to really like maybe not really like him but you're you're starting to feel like it's not so bad you know as you see him talk and you listen to him see him go through all these things and putting that problem over there that's not him he keeps telling you that's that's that over there is, is what caused it right away over there so that feeling you're getting for those of you who have fallen into this won't be very many of you that's what's happening you're seeing a psychopath be a psychopath and the whole time this guy listening is just riveted he's like he's all up in it man and he's not asking anything mark because he, he doesn't know to he's he's he's, in, he's gonna forgive him no matter what happens this cat's gonna forgive him for it that's his job that's what he does that's what he represents is all those things while at the same time he, if you turn the sound down on this and watch this guy the, the the dobson guys he's he's talking to him in this it looks like he's asking him if he can be wormed that's that's how sort of painful and just open faced he is on this it just that's what it looks like to me anyway so um yeah we're just seeing a psychopath be a psychopath here and um he's getting his point across staying staying in line making sure everything happens the way it should all right we good about pornography do you remember what pushed you over that edge do you remember well, the decision to go for it do you remember where you decided to throw caution to the wind Again, when you say pushed, I don't. I, I know what you're saying. I don't want to yes, infer again. I, I understand that. That, that I was that, 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 that I was clear. some helpless yeah. kind of a victim, and yet uh, we're talking about an influence, which that is the influence of violent types of media and violent pornography, which had an was, was an indispensable link in the chain of behavior, the chain of events that led. To the behaviors, to the to the assaults, to the murders, and what and what have you. <laughs> it's a it's a very difficult thing to describe. Uh, uh, the the sensation of the the uh, of of reaching that point where you, where I knew that. It, it was like something had, say, snapped. That I knew that uh, that I couldn't control it anymore. That these barriers that that I had had been uh, I had learned as a child uh, that had been instilled in me were not enough to hold me back with respect to 
seeking out and, and harming somebody. Would it be? Ted, after you committed your first murder, what was the emotional effect on you? What happened in the days after that? Well, again, this, please understand that, that even all these years later, it's very difficult to, to talk to about talk it, about and, and, and reliving it through talking about it uh, is, is uh, difficult to say the least, but I want you to understand uh, what happened. It was like coming out of some kind of horrible trance or, or dream. Um, I can only liken it to after, you know, I, I don't want to over-dramatize it, but to have been possessed by something so awful and so alien, and then the next morning wake up from it, remember what happened and realize that basically, I mean, in, in the eyes of the law, certainly in the eyes of God, you're responsible to have to wake up in the morning and, and realize what I had done. And with a clear mind and all my essential moral and ethical feelings intact at that moment, absolutely horrified that I was capable of doing something like that. You really... All right, Chase, what do you got? I think there's an element of honesty here, believe it or not. I think there is a regret period that follows a lot of these murders with uh, psychopaths where they uh, are... The regret is mostly centered around fear of being caught and fear of, of what they did or being judged by family members and people they're close to of what they did. Uh, it doesn't come across as emotional accessing here uh, because there aren't many emotions in there at all. And he's making eye contact with these very key points. Right in the video, you can see it. And the key points are I was in a trance. I was possessed. Eye contact right at those quick moments. And then looks back down. It was like an alien encounter. And then you wake up from it. You're responsible. What I had done, my ethical feelings intact. And then finally, his last eye contact, capable of doing something like that, right at those little moments. And that's a pure, perfect example of a true psychopath using some kind of charisma manipulation. It's exactly what's happening there. Getting you to connect on very deep key points. In 1989, the night before his execution, Bundy had an interview with a psychologist named James Dobson, Ph.D., the video you're actually watching right now, during which he diagnosed himself, since I'm going on all these diagnoses, he's diagnosed, diagnosing himself as an addictive disorder personality or a porn addict is what he diagnosed himself as. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, we can only wish that he'd gotten like Bozo, the clown videos or something else when he was young, and maybe he would have turned it into a comic. Who knows? Yeah. This guy is, there's some reason for everything that happens to him. And when he starts this, you see blinking. I think he's processing for how to answer a question. And then he is calculating what to say. And you hear him out, breathe out pretty heavily, like an exasperation for what to say. And then he starts to use words that make him sound like a human being. He actually starts talking about feelings and that kind of stuff. My note says, listen to him acting like a human being. He isn't. He's a monster. He's a stalker. He's a murderous, dead, murderous human being, if we want to call him that. He's walking the borderline here between being a hardcore narcissist and asking for pity. That's a dangerous thing for those guys. And they're only going to do it when they think there's a benefit to it. They don't want to be perceived as weak, for sure. Well, now he doesn't have to worry about being perceived as weak in prison because he knows the next day is going away. I have no doubt that this is kind of a, every time I've heard his story, I believe it builds up and then he kills, and then he gets a break, and it builds up. And I've heard him say that over and over and over when you see all the in, all the interviews with him. But you're seeing why people trusted him, because he is capable of using words that sound like a normal human being. And he puts that out there when he needs it. And then he does your closed eye talking, Chase, and he does every time. Like I said, we both are on the same page, that locked eye contact with a request for approval when he's got his key points of his story. I'm telling you, when I listen to this, all I see is a scene from Cat People or American Werewolf in London or some movie from the 80s that he watched where you wake up in the morning, there's a dead body in your hotel room, and you're like, how'd that happen? That's what he's making this out to be. Yeah, I get it. He did some monstrous stuff. He probably didn't think he was ever capable of that. But he doesn't say, 
I didn't do it ever. He says, I was, what was this word? I was horrified that I was capable of doing this. Well, he wasn't horrified enough to go do something about it, to do something else. And we'll hear him go further and further into more of this pushing blame off of self and onto something else as we go into here. This is a werewolf story. Mark, what do you got? Yep. So uh, gesture wise, I love the, the steeple at the start, which is taking the high ground and then to the lips to the high ground of silence. So it is it is a, a, a status imperative status <laughs> status. Thank you. Everybody can drink now. Nobody uh, jumped in with me. What happened? <laughs> I, was, I was going to. Was, it we've is been a, waiting on that. It is I'm a like, what do we do it? A status play. <laughs> Status. 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 Uh, to, to take the silence, to, to say nothing. Of course, it isn't a status play. Status. Yes, status. exactly. He doesn't want to say anything because it won't play to his agenda to actually describe what really happens in this situation. Uh, and he says, you know, it's difficult to talk about. I, I don't think it's actually difficult for him to talk about the acts. I'm sure he's done that time and time again and, and quite possibly enjoyed doing that. It may be difficult for him to describe the feelings around that because of his disconnect with feelings. But but to this, to talk about the acts, no, I think that's that's a lie. But he plays the status of not talking about it. Status. Thank status. You. It's the last time you'll hear that from me. Uh, and now he is is the victim again, and he starts playing these classic mems throughout cinema and literary history. We've got uh, Dr. Jackal and Mr. Hyde there. We've got the Sonambul Sonambulist, the, 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 the first ever horror film, the, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Um, he, he plays that idea. I was in a trance. He's then got like alien abduction. He's got all of them in there. All of these possibilities, they're being taken over by an entity. All these mems in popular culture that might cause us to go, yeah, no, I totally get it. You were, you were, you were sleepwalking. There was a part of you that was a monster that you're not in control of. You were taken over by an entity. You were visited in the night by things from another planet. All of those very, very reasonable so that we can go, okay. Uh, we let you off. This is a bigger problem than just you. This is a big world problem going on here. Go about your business. Um, and, and then he ends again. He really lands it at the ends of his paragraphs there where he goes um, ethics and morals intact and then checks in with the interviewer to go you're buying this are you into this are you are we going along with this one and of course the interviewer uh doesn't go well come on mate ethics and morals intact you have no morals you have no ethics and here's why as we're about to find out the ethics and morals that he have has or does not have fits with the agenda of the interviewer the interviewer just isn't some doctor. Uh, he's a very politically connected uh, individual who has a massive agenda for this whole thing. And I'll come to why psychopaths are really useful for social agendas uh, in one moment. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. This is great because he's asking about emotions and he has none. He doesn't understand it. So he doesn't know what they are. He understands what they are. He knows what they are, but he doesn't have any. So he's acting. He has to because he has no idea how to talk about emotions, describe them and what they do because he's seen them. He knows he's got to imitate, he's got to imitate them and learn how to look like he has emotions, but he doesn't know how to word it because he doesn't have those feelings. He can't describe feelings because he has none and he's never had any. And that long breath and he's looking for the, from his depth of pain and all that stuff, he's doing it wrong. He's doing it wrong. That's why it looks so weird and looks so odd. And that guy keeps and Dobson keeps looking at him. And if you look when Dobson's looking at him, he's, it looks like, again, almost like a confusion of, uh, of that doesn't look right to me. But then again, he's wide open. He's going to his thing there. His mode usually is to forgive people for what they've done and move along and try to be everybody's good and all that. But he doesn't understand what a psychopath is. And he really doesn't, doesn't understand that's what he's dealing with and what's being done to him at that point. So he, he, as he goes on, he describes this possession. All these things, again, 
making sure he lets him know it's not his fault, man. No, it's he's been possessed. Something else has got him. It's not his fault at all. So we're seeing acting. He doesn't he doesn't have feelings, never had emotions, and he doesn't know how to describe them. So that's why it's it's odd going through there looking like that. And those emotions don't look that way. His sadness emotions don't look the way they should because he doesn't know how to execute those. Ted, after you committed your first murder, what was the emotional effect on you? What happened in the days after that? Well, again, this, please understand that, that even all these years later, it's very difficult to, to talk to about talk it about and, to, and, and reliving it through talking about it to, is, is uh, difficult to say the least, but I want you to understand what happened. It was like coming out of some kind of horrible trance or, or dream. Um, I can only liken it to after, you know, I, I don't want to over-dramatize it, but to have been possessed by something so awful and so alien, and then the next morning wake up from it, remember what happened and realize that basically, I mean, in, in the eyes of the law, certainly in the eyes of God, you're responsible uh, to, have, to wake up in the morning and, and realize what I had done. And with a clear mind and all my essential moral and ethical feelings intact at that moment. Uh, uh, absolutely horrified that I was capable of doing something like that. You really something like that. You really hadn't known that before. Uh, there is just absolutely no way to describe first the brutal urge to do that kind of thing and then what happens is once it it has been more or less satisfied and recedes you might say or is spent that that sense that kind of energy level recedes and basically i became my myself again and i want people to understand this too and i'm not saying this gratuitously because it's important that people understand this that basically i was a normal person. Uh, I, I wasn't uh, some guy hanging out uh, at bars or a bum or um, I wasn't a pervert in the sense that, you know, people look at somebody and say, I know there's something wrong with him and just tell. I mean, I, I, I was essentially a normal person. I had good friends. I, I, uh, I led a normal life except for this one small but very potent and very destructive segment of it that I kept very secret and very close to myself and didn't let, let anybody know about it. And part of the shock and horror for my dear friends and family when, years ago when I was first arrested was that they just, there was no clue. They looked at me and they looked at the, you know, the, um, the all-American boy. And I'm, uh, I mean, I wasn't perfect, but it was, it was, it, I want to be quite candid with you. I was, it, yeah. I was okay. Okay. Uh, I was. Uh, the basic humanity and, and basic spirit that God gave me was intact, but it, unfortunately it became overwhelmed at times. And I think people need to recognize that it's not some kind of... The, 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 those of us who, are, who have been so much influenced by violence in the media, in particular pornographic violence, are not some kinds of inherent monsters. We are your sons and we are your husbands. And we grew up in regular families. And pornography can reach out and snatch a kid out of any house today. He, he snatched me out of my home, it snatched me out of my home 20, 30 years ago. And as diligent as my parents were, and they were diligent in protecting their children. And as good a Christian home as we had, and we had a wonderful Christian home, uh, there is no protection against the kinds, that, the kinds of influences that are loose in a society that, that, that tolerates. Greg, what do you got? Uh, okay, he starts off with a contemptuous smile. You can't miss that half smile. And then he goes to what 
you, Scott, call fading facts. I call swallowing words. They just disappear. And when he asks, that's when he's asking him at, you really hadn't known. Then he gives this non answer, this stammering, rambling thing until he gets his feet back under him. And he starts talking about being a normal person. He's using words that Scott, you'll say he has no understanding of. I think you're probably right. I would ask him, what does normal mean to you? Let him d define it. He even then tries quickly to say, look, I didn't hang out in bars. I wasn't a bum. I was not a pervert that anybody could tell. He even clarifies that. I think that's one of the weirdest ones of the whole thing. Nobody could look at him and think he was a pervert. Um, and he nose touches when he says that. Now, he has, doesn't touch his nose a lot in here. We're going to see more when he gets to some of the more profound moments in this. We'll see him manipulating his mouth and touching his nose more than usual. He raises his head again, and he looks back up. He actually turtles. We didn't see, we didn't see that much in this thing. And I've been cautious not to talk about shoulder movement because his hands are cuffed. And if you've ever dealt with cuffed people, it's hard to read shoulder movement. It's just tough. But he does turtle in this case. And he said, except for this one small, anybody else think that's a really poor choice of words to call this problem a small problem? That's in his mind, it's okay to call it that. He says, I wasn't perfect. What does that mean? I would ask him what is perfect. I was okay. He's using convincing language. And then he goes to this whole thing, and I'll just, I won't stay here a lot. I'll just talk about when he gets to Christian again. Chase, the same thing you and I keep bringing up. Locked eye contact and brow up when he's telling his key points to his stories. And now he's going to tell us about this virus that creates werewolves out of your brothers, sisters, whatever. And he's just looking for a way to push all that off so that he's creating some kind of humanity. And Mark, I'm with you. He knows his audience. He knows that it's not, you know, it's not atheist watching Dobson's channel. It's the conservative right, and this is the, the Reagan era. This is actually the Bush era, but Reagan-Bush era, and it is a big move. And this guy had a big program. Uh, he still had the thing still out there called Focus on the Family. This is tightly tied, and it was one of his crusades is anti-alcohol, anti-pornography. And so you, he will start feeding in what you need to hear. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think there's, there's so much going on here because his focus here is to really make sure he explains the problem and it's not him, how he was a normal guy. And he goes through explaining all these things. And I think what you're seeing is him being uncomfortable doing that because he's just making this, this all up. He knows what he has to say. He's thought about this before. He's got his story. I'm going to have to tell him I was normal. Everything was fine except for this one little thing, the part where he cut off people's heads and stuff. But he didn't, doesn't say that. He just calls it this one little thing and, so, and, and tries to make that almost non-existent. After everything was perfect. Came from a Christian family. He was a good guy. He really was. Oh, Teddy was a good boy. He was all these things that were wonderful. And he's building this picture in his mind. So this guy will, as as is his gig, as his job to do, is forgive him for what he's done and go forward being positive with him. But he's trying to convince this guy that he's not a bad guy and it's not his fault. Um, and he's coming on like he's just this, his family he just could have gone to this guy's church. Very sane. Very sane people that, that he hangs out with and, and preaches to and talks to. The same kind of folks. That's who, that's who he is and where he came from and who his folks are. So as he's creating this normal person that, that has been destroyed by this outside force that came in and just, and just destroyed this, this normal good old boy, this good old Teddy when he was a, just a young kid, and that's what, it all, that's what it all happened. So again, I'm still going down that same road. He's trying to convince him that he's a normal guy, everything's fine. You're right, that lock eye contact and, and locking with him on the most important parts. He's just being a psychopath. That's what they do. That's what they do. All right, uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so his imagery here is, is brilliant. Uh, the all-American boy, which is your sons, your husbands. Okay, imagine yourself sitting at home in a conservative Christian America and hearing that your sons, your husbands, good Christian people are liable to turn into him if you don't take out pornography, if you don't turn out and specific stuff that is on cable television. Now, it just so happens that that agenda is the exact agenda of the interviewer. That's what he funds, is the taking out of that. I get that there's a Christian idea of the forgiveness, but this person is, is, that he's being interviewed by is a moral crusader who puts money and, and action behind that crusade to take out specific media that he believes, along with uh, Bundy pretending that he believes 
that that is the root of all evil and that it is legion across across the media right now. So he's spinning him almost an exact copy of Dobson's own ideology. Yeah, and we know it's ideology because we can predict exactly what he's going to say next, exactly what he's going to say, say next. Now, so what's interesting for me about this and that he's he's bringing forward some of these classic Reagan, you know, family values ideology is that in society, some psychopaths are incredibly useful and societies do use them in order to push forward an agenda. And I'd say, unfortunately, that's what's happening now. And that's why Dobson is so accepting of the story, the lies that are being put forward by Bundy right now, because the lies are useful. Lying is one of our most important social skills, knowing when to do it and when to tell the truth is important. But accepting a lie is a really important social skill. And if you have a specific social agenda, it's very important to accept some of the extreme lies that some people will tell. And the extreme lie here is that pornography or, or even just violent movies on, um, on what we would consider now normal TV is actually the thing that will corrupt America. Very similar to a great film, go and watch it, it's called Reefer Madness. And it uses the exact same setup of ordinary kids, just ordinary good American kids, and all you need is a little toke on that, and it suddenly, the whole of society falls to bits. Um, it's fantastic spin. When I f first started watching this, I didn't expect to get any of this i didn't expect any i didn't know what was going to come along i thought we were just going to get you know a fairly extreme psychopath doing that kind of stuff i didn't think we were going to get some extreme social agenda going on and everybody impl complicit in it i think it's fantastic chase what do you got on this one yeah i i agree with you and he starts this off by saying that the urge was brutal and not the crime pay attention to that so that's some pretty powerful language the urges were were powerful. He recoils kind of at this word pervert, like you were talking about, Greg, then kind of wrinkles his face, maybe in what he's concealing disgust or trying to overcome the expression of disgust. This is a, a, a key point for the interrogator. It's wiping his face, uncharacteristic, boom, 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 three in a row. Key point for the interrogator to use this word later in, in the interview. I know I'm going to use the word pervert later on maybe I'll, I'll use it to piss him off maybe i'm going to use it to say i know you're not one of those xyz type of people it just depends on where the interview goes but here we also see the shift that we saw in video number one when he was talking about the boys and how the boys acted the antisocial behavior of the boys we aren't monsters we are your sons we are your husbands we grew up with these regular lives and pornography here is described as a kidnapper Pornography is a kidnapper. It snatched him from his home. So he normalizes this behavior in a way that anyone could do what he did. Just one drop, like Mark here was saying, just one drop. You get one nudie mag, as they probably called it in the time of these uh, this interview here. So during one super interesting psychiatry podcast called Ted Bundy, The Dark Triad, several experts uh, that were on this podcast who are medical experts and psychology experts were commented that the serial killer showed signs of an extreme form of narcissism called Machiavellianism, which is another diagnosis since I'm talking about that so much. This personality trait named after this Renaissance Italian political philosopher named Machiavelli describes a person who's going to deceive and exploit people in order to achieve their personal goals no matter who it hurts or no matter how many people get affected or, or downtrodden in the process. Like that. You really hadn't known that before? Uh, there is just absolutely no way to describe first the brutal urge to do that kind of thing and then what happens is once it it has been more or less satisfied and received, you might say, or spent that, that sense, that kind of energy 
level recedes. And basically, I became my, myself again. I, and I want people to understand this too, and I'm not saying this gratuitously because it's important that people understand this. That basically, I was a normal person. Uh, I, I wasn't uh, some guy hanging out uh, at bars or a bum, or um, I wasn't a pervert in the sense that you know people look at somebody and say, "I know there's something wrong with him," and just tell. I mean, I I was essentially a normal person. I had good friends. I I uh, I led a normal life, except for this one small but very potent and very destructive segment of it that I kept very secret and very close to myself and didn't let, let anybody know about it. And part of the shock and horror for my dear friends and family when, years ago when I was first arrested was that they just, there was no clue. They looked at me and they looked at the, you know, the, um, the all-American boy. And I'm, uh, I mean, I wasn't perfect, but it's, it's, it, I want to be quite candid with you. I was, it, yeah. I was okay, okay? Uh, I was. And the basic humanity and, and basic spirit that God gave me was intact, but it, unfortunately it became overwhelmed at times. And I think people need to recognize that it's not some kind of... The, 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 those of us who, are, who have been so much influenced by violence in the media, in particular pornographic violence, are not some kinds of inherent monsters. We are your sons and we are your husbands. And we grew up in regular families. And pornography can reach out and snatch a kid out of any house today. He, he snatched me out of my home. It snatched me out of my home 20, 30 years ago. And, and as diligent as my parents were, uh, and they were diligent in protecting their children. And as good a Christian home as we had, and we had a wonderful Christian home, uh, there is no protection against the kinds that the kinds of influences that are loose in a society that, that, that tolerates. Mm. You, you feel this really deeply, don't you? Ted, outside these walls right now, there are several hundred reporters that wanted to talk to you. Yeah. And you asked me to come here from California because you had something you wanted to say. This hour that we have together uh, is not just an interview with a man who's scheduled to die tomorrow morning. I am here and you're here because of this message that you're talking about right here. You really feel that hardcore pornography and the doorway to it, softcore pornography, is doing untold damage to other people and causing other women to be abused and killed the way you did others. Listen, I'm no social scientist and I haven't done a survey. I mean, I, I don't pretend that I know what John Q. Citizen thinks about this. <clears throat> but I've lived in prison for a long time now. And I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question, without exception, deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. There's no question about it. The FBI's own study on serial homicide shows that the most common interest among serial killers is pornography. Yeah, that's true. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I'm just going to say one thing. Who needs Ted Bundy doing this spin when the interviewer will just do it for him? The interviewer has now taken over the spin. And that's not because he's being duped by a psychopath. That's because he's useful for him. This is verbatim what, you know, it, it's no surprise. There could be a hundred other people who were chosen. Could have been a hundred other people who accepted this is the marriage that's going on right now. This is the marriage that has happened right now before his execution. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, that, you know, Dobson felt, um, felt some sympathy for him in the end, or certainly saw how, if you could keep him alive a bit longer, 
then you'd be able to use him even further as a tool. This, for, for Dobson's agenda, this is a really powerful tool because he doesn't pick him up on his crooked logic there, which is correlation is, is not causation. Yeah? Without, without exception, every violent offender has this kind of relationship with violent pornography. But there's also a bunch of other correlations that we could put together, some of them so outlandish and some of them so possible, but potentially none of them actually relevant or none of them the actual causation of this. And the interviewer does not pick up on that. This is a psychiatrist. This is a good you know, psychologist. Good. He understands logic. He doesn't pick him up on that logic at all. He doesn't bring that logic to his audience and, and say, look, audience, shouldn't really pay any attention to this crooked logic going on here. Why? It's not useful for him to bring up the crooked logic that, that goes on. He's now just delivering his message. And I would say uh, he knows it. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yes, yeah, so a long time ago, when I took one of my first corporate gigs, there was an ERP solution that had failed, and they hired a bunch of people to go in and fix it. And I remember sitting in the room my first day there, and I didn't have glasses on those days, and I was doing this. And the reason I was doing it was to avoid having to pay attention to the train wreck unraveling in front of me. I didn't know what to say. These guys all outranked me. And when finally the guy I worked for said, Greg, are you feeling stressed? I just opened my eyes and said, no, I wonder how all you people have jobs. And that was because I was trying to avoid everything. That's exactly what this guy's doing, exactly what he's doing, because he doesn't know how to feel. Scott, you're dead on. This is just a shell. This guy didn't know what to say or how to feel. If he did, when he took his hands away from his eyes, you would see disrot, you would see musculature moving in his face as he tried to come back to normal. There's nothing, nothing. It's flat, there's no affect at all, and he just opens his face. He can't cry because he doesn't know how to cry. He figures if he puts his head down, he'll look like he's crying. This is just another spider to the fly move. Come on in, come on in, I'm waiting for you. But Mark, to your point, he doesn't need to. He starts talking for him. Then he does, the, it, if you ever do reenactment, in reenactment, there's a whole group of people they would call far bees. A person who would come up and say, far be it from me to judge your kit, but boom. That's exactly what he does here. He does a disclaimer ahead of his resume statement, to use your words, Chase, and then he goes into a hell of a resume statement. He goes into, I'm no social scientist. That When somebody says something like that, that's a predecessor to, but I'm gonna tell you what a social scientist would tell you. That's exactly what they're saying. He clears his throat and he starts that diatribe. Here are my credentials. Apart from being a werewolf, I've been in prison for a long time. I conf I've confronted others like me, I've confronted myself, I've met a lot of folks, and, 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 and. Then he tells you, this is all about this. He's closing to give this guy what he wants so the guy will let him finish what he has to say next. And then he takes some sort of moral high ground as he quotes an FBI study. That's holy ground. Now I've got credentials. And he does a little compression. This guy, whether Mark, the guy's okay with him working or not, he's being worked, clearly. And if this were working now, this is a psychologist who knows exactly what he's looking at. Imagine this is Susie Q. Homemaker. This is Susie Q. College student. This is a woman coming home from work at night, whatever it is. And you meet this guy and he can use all these tools at his disposal and knows not to let you see that he has no emotion. Imagine how powerful that is. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, totally agree. And I will say this, I will admit this, that 15 minutes or so into meeting this guy, I probably wouldn't know he's a psychopath. I, I, With all of my training and all of our training that we talk about a lot, we can get duped in, in sh these short-term interactions by these people as well as anybody else. When we teach, like this is how you spot a psychopath, we are looking from the outside. So it's hard to see it once you're inside of that bubble. And that's why this repetitive training to get yourself up on this just awareness is really important. There's no vaccination against these people. So you've got to be on your best game. So I just want you to know that I could be duped by this, uh, this kind of person. This message he's delivering really seems like a sincere desire to get the word out because I'm thinking he's got a day to live. Why the porno thing? But then I thought, what would a narcissist agree to do an interview for? Uh, extreme narcissist. And 
how would they agree to make an interview? And he sought this reporter out. So he's basically thinking, how can I do this interview and be a hero? So the only way that I can take a hero angle is to take a stance against something that lots of people don't like. And I think that's what we're really doing here. It's a battle cry against a false aggressor. So this, I think this red herring maneuver is performed extremely well as his communication is damn near perfect on this to the average person, except for the emotional impact on things where there's not emotion to speak of. Antisocial personality disorder. Let's talk about that real quick. This group of psychologists, which is 73 in total at the University of Kentucky, uh, wanted to study Ted Bundy's mental health, and the majority of them agreed that he had antisocial personality disorder. Nearly 80% believe that Bundy was a perfect example of the disorder, checking off all of the, the DSM criteria at the time, whatever number it was, of egocentrism acting on personal gratification, this law of uh, social uh, norms, lacking empathy, antagonism, disinhibition. And antisocial personality disorder and psychopathy are not the same thing. They're not the same thing. So you can have, you can be a psychopath and have that, all of them do. You can have uh, antisocial personality without being a full-blown psychopath. Interesting fun fact for the day. Scott, what do you got? Fun facts. And, fun facts and psychopaths. Ted with Bundy. <laughs> Chase Hughes. All right. I agree with you completely there. We're seeing more. I'll keep this one short. We're seeing act again, like everybody's been saying. He's just acting. And that whole business of, of pressing on his tear ducts, that's where he got the tears from. You know, that that breathing in through his teeth, that sucking in through his teeth, that's just over the top. He doesn't know what he's, he doesn't know how to do that, but he is suckering this guy in. The guy's coming in, he's letting him take over, and oh, poor pitiful me. And he doesn't know how to ask the kind of questions we would ask somebody, you know, Dobson. So he's he, so that I think that's what I agree with you, Mark. I think that's what's happened there. He just he doesn't know how to he doesn't know how to do that. So. He sort of let the guy take over at that point. I got nothing new on this one because it's just uh, we're seeing a psychopath be a psychopath at this point. If you are a reporter or you interview people at all for a living, even if it's like for a job interview or something, there is a book that you have to buy. It's worth about 7,000 times whatever you're going to spend on it when you order it on Amazon. It's this book right here by James Pyle and Marianne Carinch. This is the book that got me started in understanding uh, how to ask better questions and how to get information out of people. Find out anything from anyone, anytime. Fantastic book. You, you feel this really deeply, don't you? Ted, outside these walls right now, there are several hundred reporters that wanted to talk to you. Yeah. And you asked me to come here from California because you had something you wanted to say. This hour that we have together uh, is not just an interview with a man who's scheduled to die tomorrow morning. I am here and you're here because of this message that you're talking about right here. You really feel that hardcore pornography and the doorway to it, softcore pornography, is doing untold damage to other people and causing other women to be abused and killed the way you did others. Listen, I'm no social scientist and I haven't done a survey. I mean, I, I don't pretend that I know what John Q. Citizen thinks about this. <clears throat> but I've lived in prison for a long time now. And I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question, without exception, deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. There's no question about it. The FBI's own study on serial homicide shows that the most common interest among serial killers is pornography. Yeah, that's true. If, you know, if I were able to ask you the questions that are being asked out there, Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most important as you come down to perhaps your final hours. Are you thinking about all those victims out there and their families? 
well, who are so wounded, you know, years later, their lives have not returned to normal. They will never return to normal. Absolutely. Are, are you carrying that load, that weight? Is the remorse there? Again, I, I know that people will accuse me of being self-serving, but we're beyond that now. I mean, I'm just telling you how I feel. But through God's help, I have been able to come to the point where I, much too late, but ne better late than never, feel the hurt and the pain that I am responsible for. Yes, absolutely. In the past few days, myself and a number of investigators have been talking about unsolved cases, murders that I was involved in. And it's hard to, it's hard to talk about all these years later because it revives in me all those terrible feelings and those thoughts that I have steadfastly and, 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 and diligently dealt with, and I think successfully, with the love of God. And yet it's reopened that and I felt the pain and I felt the horror again of all that. And I can only hope that those who I have harmed, and those who I've caused so much grief, even if they don't believe my expression of sorrow and remorse, will believe what I'm saying now, that there is loose in their towns and their communities. People like me today, whose dangerous impulses are being fueled day in and day out, by violence in the media in its various forms, particularly sexualized violence. And what scares me, and let's come into the present now, because what I'm talking about happened 30, 20, 30 years ago, that is in my formative stages. And what scares and appalls me, Dr. Dobson, is when I see what's on cable TV, <laughs> some of the movies, I mean, some of the violence in the movies uh, that come into homes today, was stuff that they that they wouldn't show in yeah. X-rated adult theaters 30 years ago. This stuff, the slasher is, movies that you're talking about. That stuff <clears throat> is, I'm telling you, from personal experience, the most that is graphic violence yeah. on screen, particularly as it gets into the home yeah. to children who may be unattended or or unaware that they may be a Ted Bundy who has that that vulnerability. To that that predisposition to be influenced by that kind of behavior, by that kind of of, of uh, movie, that kind of violence, there are kids sitting out there, switching the TV dial around, and come upon these movies late at night, or I don't know when they're on, but they're on, and any kid can watch them. It's scary when I think what would have happened to me if I had seen. I'm scary enough. <laughs> I mean, that I just ran into stuff outside the home, but to, to, to know that children are watching that kind of thing today or can pick up their phone and dial away for it or send away for it. Uh. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Every single ounce of pain that he describes here is about himself. He's asked about the victims. He describes the pain that he endured. And psychopathy is... A personality trait that falls under antisocial and people with antisocial disorder have kind of a long term pattern of violating the rights of other human beings without remorse. And one of the people in the study, let's go into this study again. Dr. Thomas Whittaker says that uh, Dr. Harvey Cleckley's analysis is mostly accurate when he said, and I quote, however, Bundy would also be diagnosed with necrophilia, paraphilia and sadism more precisely. And that's what I got here. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I was just saying, I would absolutely hire him as a speechwriter. It's it's actually brilliant what he's done there. He started off with that the trigger for him was the trash that people were throwing out of their houses and him in the highways and byways picking up that stuff. That's mm. the thing that developed him. Now the trash is in the home and it's coming through your cable TV and Dobson helps him by going the slasher movies. He goes, yeah, the slasher movies. So he's now, he's, now you are not safe. Concerned Mothers of America, it is 
is in your home right now. Yeah, your kids, your kids would be safer walking the streets. It gets piped through your TV right now. That's how bad it is. This is utterly brilliant what he's what he's doing here. And Dobson is not stopping him. He is not saying, hold on a moment, that isn't accurate, that's not true, you can't perpetrate that kind of mythology on the audience. You, it is you and you alone. You are an utterly unique uh, and, and, and outlier personality of the most extreme. He's allowing him to perpetuate this mythology of the trash is now in your home and it's called cable TV. I mean, it's just, uh, I don't know. At this point, I'm not quite sure who I'm most disgusted by. Uh, both of them, I think. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, <clears throat> my favorite part of this whole thing is he asks a question, Dobson asks a question and feeds the answer in what we would refer to as a leading question. And by that, uh, he projects and asks something about, is there remorse there for you? Did you hear a single word about remorse in the entire? Now, I project the answer I want. You, you must feel remorse. Never comes up once. He goes on to ramble, and you know he's going to because he goes and gets a good breath before he starts down that path. And he delivers a sermon of sorts, honestly. He just goes on and on and on about the problem is this and the problem is that. The problem is never me. The problem is this. And then he this. I don't want to talk about that for fear it will revive all these terrible feelings in me. I think he's that's an honest thing. When he says these terrible feelings, he's not talking about horror. He's talking about the other feelings, all these things. The other thing to watch is now we're starting to see him manipulate his mouth. And watch the times he does it. He talks about children being at home alone. And he talks about horror. Those things are inside his head deep in there that caused him to do that. I would start paying attention every time I notice him touching his mouth, we'll see it increase as he starts to talk more and more closely about the actual acts. I think he's got something deep in there. Every time he touched her, I'd just start making notes and poke and prod when he did that. Reviving me all those terrible feelings. There's not a single word about remorse. I felt the pain and horror of all that. I don't think he's pontificating at this point. I think he clearly knows what he's trying to get across and he's trying to get enough message. Listen to the lilt of it. It's preacher-like almost. He's trying to get across to this, to Dobson to get him to a point. And then he uses the word believe. He's closing this out. I think it's masterful, Mark. I think it's intentional. He says they won't believe this, but what I hope they will believe, and his volume goes up and he makes hard, hard eye contact, is when I say that I am, boom. And he's going back to that story of the wolf, of the werewolf virus, and now they're piping werewolf virus into all your homes. So everybody's going to be a werewolf. Watch out. That's what I got. Scott, what do you got? <laughs> wow. wow, Greg, if you hadn't moved, man, I was I would have gone and then said, okay, we're good to go. God, that's the worst. That's worst what Bundy does. That. Takes you to the extreme, you see. Wow. Takes you to the, the that is the edge. That is so embarrassing. Of course, I can always cut all that <laughs> We've all out. done it. I've done one for about two minutes, I think. Wow, that's too bad. I think that is a record, though. Wow, I'll save that for the end. How's that sound? We can dub over it. You can have Bundy talking. Oh, man. Chase, the crown has been taken. Wow, that's too yes. bad. I'm sorry, fellas. Damn it. We've all done it. 
<laughs> I'm just hearing that air conditioning back there. I'm trying to make it so that doesn't happen, so you don't hear it. So I'm not used to muting anything. You know, you don't. You need uh, to, don't need to explain. Scott, what tip do you off? Yeah, Greg. I moved Greg. around like this at one point. No, you came up, Greg went like this or something. I was like, what's that? And then What's that mean? Yeah, and then I looked at you, Chase. That's my go-to. And you were like this. I was like, good point. <laughs> so I think of, and I was like, okay, it's over. Good one. Damn it. Okay. Now so, let's find out what you actually said. Yeah, let's hear it. Okay. Oh, man. I can't <laughs> do it again. Good. I was up in it, man. I was selling that shit. No, this is a good one. You got it. Roll it. Okay, here we go. Take two. Okay, okay. well, to in a nutshell. back to you? <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm still, I'll deal with it. Okay, in a nutshell, what we're seeing is I agree with you guys. I agree with, I, I do agree with you guys, but hear me out because uh, I think he got lost. I think he had all these things he was going to talk about. And he's trying to stay on point. And he's, he's in the woods. He sees the path. He can't quite get back up to the path. So he's, he's in this big pile of stuff going, okay, yeah, kids, and then porno, and then there's this that happens, and then I got to get, let's see, we'll talk, this happened, let me wait a minute, as he's looking around, then he comes back up with something else. He's making all of his points and trying to stay on the path, but he's not quite on the path at this point. So the being the interviewer that this guy Dobson is not, we would jump in at that point. And, and I mean, we would expect the, um, the news person jump in and start saying stuff. I think he's kind of expecting that too. I agree with you guys. I, I think what he's doing, he's getting all of his points across and he's laying out this story. And it's making a very vivid picture with all that. But I think he's he's lost from the path there. I think he's trying to stay on it, but he keeps sliding off as he goes down down the road there. So, okay, we good? But by the way, do you think he he lays in that piece about I've been having some talks with investigators to see if he can get a last minute reprieve? He did try. Oh, That's fact. Yeah. He did. Yeah. Try. Yeah. He's wanting to do that. So he said, I've got so much more information I could tell you guys about. And this thing, oh, yeah, hang he on, try. there's more we may not know. You know, he he's going to try. try anything, you know, I would think. If, you know, if I were able to ask you the questions that are being asked out there, Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most important as you come down to perhaps your final hours. Are you thinking about all those victims out there and their families well, who are so wounded? You know, years later, their lives have not returned to normal. They will never return to normal. Absolutely. Are, are you carrying that load, that weight? Is the remorse there? <sighs> Again. I know that people will accuse me of being self-serving, but we're beyond that now. I mean, I'm just telling you how I feel. But through God's help, I have been able to come to the point where I've... Much too late, but better late than never, feel the hurt and the pain that I am responsible for. Yes, absolutely. In the past few days, myself and a number of investigators have been talking about unsolved cases murders that I was involved in and it's hard to it's hard to talk about all these years later because it revives in me all those terrible feelings and those thoughts that I have steadfastly and, 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 and diligently dealt with and I think successfully with the love of God and yet it's reopened that and I felt the pain and I felt the horror again of all that and I can only hope that those who I have harmed, those who I've caused so much grief, even if they don't believe my expression of sorrow and remorse, will believe what I'm saying now, that there is loose in their towns and their communities, people like me today, whose dangerous impulses are being fueled day in and day out by violence in the media in its various forms, particularly sexualized violence. And what scares me, and let's come into the present now, because what I'm talking about happened 30, 20, 30 years ago, that is in my formative stages. And what scares and appalls me, Dr. Dobson, is when I see what's on cable TV, <laughs> Some of the movies, I mean, some of the violence in the movies uh, that come into homes today 
with stuff that they that they wouldn't show in yeah. X-rated adult theaters 30 years ago. This stuff, the slasher is, movies that you're talking about. That stuff <clears throat> is, I'm telling you from personal experience, the most that is graphic violence on screen particularly as it gets into the home to children who may be unattended or or unaware that they may be a Ted Bundy who has that that vulnerability to that that predisposition to be influenced by that kind of behavior by that kind of, of, of uh, movie that kind of violence there are kids sitting out there switching the TV dial around and come upon these movies late at night or I don't know when they're on but they're on and any kid can watch them it's scary when I think what would have happened to me if I had seen. I'm scary enough. I mean, that I just ran into stuff outside the home, but to, to, be, to, to know that children are watching that kind of thing today or can pick up their phone and dial away for it or send away for it. Uh. It's, uh, one of the, the final uh, murders that you committed, of course, uh, was apparently little Kimberly Leach, 12 years of age. Uh, I think the, the public outcry is greater there because an innocent child was taken from a, from a playground. What did you feel after that? What was there? Were there the normal emotions three days later? Where were you, Ted? I... Uh, I can't really talk about that right now. That's... Oh yeah. That's too painful. I would like to uh, I'd like to be able to convey to you what that that uh, that experience is like, but I can't. That I won't okay. be able to talk about that. Okay. I can't begin to understand. Well, I can try, but I I'm, I'm aware that I can't begin to understand the pain that the parents of these, of these children that I have and these young women that I have harmed feel. And I can't restore really much to them, if anything. And I won't pretend to, and I don't even expect them to forgive me, and I'm not asking for it. The, that kind of forgiveness is of God, and if they have it, they have it. If they don't, well, maybe they'll find it someday. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a creepy one. This is really among the creepiest. That whole manipulation of the mouth. Now start paying attention. When he's talking about those children or people in their home, he's touching his mouth, he's moving his lips around. He's suddenly restless when he starts asking him about this specific question around this woman. We typically associate doing this with your mouth with mental activity. Messing with your mouth the same way. When a person's playing with their mouth, usually they're thinking there's something coming up. He gets pretty restless. Uh, this is one of the rare times I'm glad I can't read minds because what's going through that guy's mind right now has zero value to humanity. Zero, in my opinion. He's smiling and grunting. He's trying his best to hide a smile. That's all he's doing. Lip compressions. Then he says, I can't really talk about that. Trying to appear to be human. But he doesn't say I can't talk about it. He says, I can't talk about it right now. That's a lead. Why can't you talk about it right now, Bundy? Because, and then, is it me or did it sound like he said, oh yeah, in there to you guys? He said, oh yeah, sounded like that in the middle of there. This is him thinking about that horrific crime, in my opinion. And then he does that horrible predatory look from under his brow, up looking at him. I use this in my classes. I used it in my class at, at the live event. You'll see his eyes are looking up over toward him with that thing. Then he starts to spout some therapy talk where he's talking about, I. Uh, I can't begin to feel like, or restore. That's the therapist talking to him. He's talking, and Mark, you said earlier, where would all this psychological stuff come from? He's been in a Skinner box for 10 years as they all studied him trying to figure out what turned him into what he is. But he then shows amusement in his face and he out, he just outright looks arrogant right there at the end. But Scott, I have written down here because we're always talking about what does a psychopath have that other people don't? Are you glib? He looks glib. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what I call what he's doing right there. <laughs> the t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, I've, I have uh, two dogs. One of them is a Belgian Malinois, and she is uh, basically not a dog. She's closer to being a velociraptor uh, than any other creature. 
Uh, but one thing she'll do before she attacks the other dog, she'll sniff a piece of furniture. And while she's sniffing that furniture, you can see her eyes tracking the other dog getting ready to pounce. And that's what I think we're seeing right here. We are seeing a professional predator. And the Belgian Malinois is bred to be a predator uh, animal. She's made for that kind of stuff. And I think he's saying that he's uh, a little bit nervous to talk about it here. And I think he's afraid to talk about it right here because discussing this would show so little emotion. He doesn't know how to fake that much emotion because he's seen how other people react to pe children getting hurt that he doesn't know how to describe it. And he doesn't know if he could sell that well enough based on the emotions he's seen in other adult humans. Scott, what do you got? Yeah. Wow, that's good, man. You're completely right. And he can't discuss it right now because he doesn't know how to. He doesn't know how to talk about emotions. Again, we're seeing a psychopath, like everybody's always saying in this thing, we're seeing a psychopath be a psychopath. He doesn't know how to talk about emotions. He doesn't know how to describe them. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about a couple minutes ago, where he he's trying to get some time. So he says, I can't, another reason he says, I can't talk about it right now is because just in case there might be something else they want to talk about, I've got some more information that I can't give out right now. So at this point, some people may have a little have got a little bit of feeling for them at this point because you have that trigger where you start hearing about God and you go, oh, okay, well, it's talking about God. It's not makes everything okay and all that. In this case, no. This is when you hear people talk about taking the Lord's name in vain. That's what he's doing when he starts talking about God the way he's talking about God. That's one of the way the way they take uh, the Lord's name in vain. Not saying, you know, saying specific other things that are graphic that I can't say on here. So. You may have that feeling like, you know what? He might be okay. I got to forgive him. No, you don't. No, you don't. He was cutting people's heads off and doing other things like that. I can't, again, we can't get too graphic with it. Horrible guy, monster. So he can't talk about it because he doesn't know how to talk about it at that point. But you're watching this happen. In Vegas, we talked about, one of the talks I did was was the, the difference in seeing and observing. It was our, our day one. We all talked about observing, right? How to observe something. If you'll observe this guy, just don't see him, watch him, watch everything he does, especially in this clip. You'll see, like so far, everybody said so far, everything a psychopath does is in this clip right there. He's a pro, man. You're right, Chasey. All over it, man. He's he's selling it in there. He's being he's being that predator. It's it's great. This is this is great stuff to see. To see this. See, I'm getting too worked up, but Anyway, so yeah, you're seeing you're seeing a, a psychopath be a psychopath at its highest level. This is good stuff. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I agree. Pe predatory gaze during that, checking out if he's buying it, and also targeting the victim as well. I think we see um, we see a, a classic animal instinct at the start, which is to to move around and judge everything from a number of angles. So you can really understand what's going on. We see this movement. What I love, and I think this is the closest in my mind that we get to seeing what he really is, who he really is. His guard is down, I think, the most during this. Because we see, in my mind, a really great piece of antisocial behavior. In, in general, in, in most societies, it's not a good look if you're wearing handcuffs. I mean, it kind of generally says, generally says you might have done something bad, um, you know, or there might be something, you know, a little bit interesting going on with yourself and your partner at the same time. But even that is, is kind of, it's a little bit swept under the, under the carpet, a little bit taboo, maybe, still, okay? So, you know, not a good kind of general social look. So there he is with his handcuffs on and he decides he wants to ease, ease it a bit. Now, if it were me and I think, you know, I'm trying to make a good effect here, I'm trying to have people think good of me, my handcuffs are not feeling so comfortable, I would just slip my hands down and just rearrange them out of sight of the camera. No, what he does is just nudge them with his chin, just nudges them with his chin. He, there is a part of him that can care about how he's seen and can manipulate and there's another part of him that absolutely does not care about society at all and that's you know that's the antisocial behavioral disorder there is is that the norms of whatever society put forward that those boundaries the individual just does not care about them and is willing to break them 
in public or in private uh, if there's a, uh, a high enough penalty uh, for it. So lovely to see. I don't think I've ever seen that behavior before. That is a first for me, uh, moving your handcuffs with your chin. It's a first. You saw it here. Not for me. <laughs> so, one of the, the final uh, murders that you committed, of course, uh, was apparently little Kimberly Leach, 12 years of age. Uh, I think the, the public outcry is greater there because an innocent child was taken from a, from a playground. What did you feel after that? What was there? Were there the normal emotions three days later? Where were you, Ted? I... Uh, I can't really talk about that right now. That's... Ooh, yeah. That's too painful. I would like to... Uh, I'd like to be able to convey to you what that... that... Uh, that experience is like, but I can't, that I won't okay. be able to talk about that. Okay. I can't begin to understand. Well, I can try, but I'm, I'm aware that I can't begin to understand the pain that the parents of these, of these children that I have and these young women that I have harmed feel. And I can't restore really much to them, if anything. And I won't pretend to, and I don't even expect them to forgive me, and I'm not asking for it. That, that kind of forgiveness is of God, and if they have it, they have it. If they don't, well, maybe they'll find it someday. Do you deserve the punishment the state has inflicted upon you? That's a very good question. And I'll answer very, very honestly. I, I don't want to die. I'm not going to kid you. I'll kid, kid you not. Um, I deserve certainly the, the most extreme punishment society has. And I deserve, I think society deserves to be protected from me and from others like me. That's for sure. Um, I think what I, what I hope will come of our discussion is I think society deserves to be protected from itself because because of we as, as we've been talking there are there are forces that loose in, in in this country particularly again uh, this kind of violent pornography uh, where on the one hand well-meaning decent people will condemn behavior of a Ted Bundy while they're walking past a a, a magazine rack full of the very kinds of things that send young kids down the road to be Ted Bundy's. That's the irony. We're talking here not just about more. We're talking. I'm, what I'm talking about is going beyond retribution, which is what people want with me. Going beyond retribution and punishment, because there is no way in the world that killing me is going to restore. Uh, those beautiful children to their parents and, and, and correct and, 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 and soothe the pain. But I'll tell you, there are lots of other kids playing in streets around this country today who, who are going to be dead tomorrow and the next day and the next day and next month because other young people are reading the kinds of things and seeing the kinds of things that are available in the media today. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so right here we're... Uh seeing a what's called a punishment question and it's sort of a tiny punishment question it's not really real a punishment question sounds like what do you think should happen to the person who did this or what should happen to the type of person who does this crime and it is astonishingly effective in children in adults it doesn't matter if you ask a person who is a child predator uh, who's trying to pretend to be innocent in an interrogation room, what do you think should happen to the person who did this? You're going to get a response like, and I'm almost quoting some of these verbatim, uh, you, what, what should happen to the person who did this? And they say, well, definitely not jail time. The person's obviously sick. Definitely, yes, absolutely, definitely some kind of apology to the family. Yeah, they should definitely apologize to the family, but they need some serious help, you know? 
the person is not really in their right mind and they definitely don't need jail, but they need some kind of help because they're obviously sick. But yes, they should apologize to the family. I'm almost paraphrasing uh, verbatim from some of the stuff that I've seen here. And that's how powerful the punishment question is. And we see it here. And I want you to imagine Scott was just in the last video talking about the psychopathy factor and how weird some of this stuff can be. I want you to imagine these exact same facial expressions while he's cutting someone's head off. No fear, no shame, no being grossed out or disgusted, the same smiles, same blink rate, and same facial expressions. And that'll give you an idea of what we are dealing with when it comes to some psychopaths. And we're not demonizing all psychopaths. Most psychopaths are not crazed serial killers uh, because the the stuff that came down from our ancestors to preserve our tribe and the people around us is deeply rooted in the brain. No matter if there's a, a, a damage in some kind of the part of the brain that's above that, the instinct to protect the tribe is still there. Mark, what do you yeah, so there's that little smile with him after he says the word status. Status. And, uh, exactly. Status. And the reason he smiles on that is because he knew in the future that whenever I said the word status, <laughs> people status. would say the word status back. <laughs> and I think that's fascinating. Fascinating that he would have that forethought around that. No, the smile there is a smile of disdain. Uh, disdain for society in general, as is disdain. It's 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 um, it's contempt for for society, for who's rained down this this punishment. And wh what I like about this chase is that this punishment question, you know, what should happen, gets turned into essentially, well, society deserves me. <laughs> that is, like, what a brilliant again, brilliant spin doctor. Like brilliant speechwriter, because he's turned this what should the punishment for you be into no, the punishment is for society in general. I don't get punished around this. You get punished. And then he spins it into an even bigger narrative now, which I would say is like the, the narrative unstoppable, the sources of Prentice, the everlasting porridge pot, the thing that keeps on cooking forever. He's now saying, look, strike me down now, but but others will poke up everywhere. Like my type is now legion because you let that tap run on the filth of cable TV. So this is really, you know, if he's leaving us with, with anything and that's why look you might say to yourself hey you know you really need to be disgusted with ted bundy and i, and I am you know he's, he's not a nice guy but you have somebody in the room who could stop this nonsense being spouted you have somebody who can go well that's just not true it isn't true that the that good kids will be tainted by cable tv and these murderers will spout up everywhere you could have somebody who would go that's just not true um bundy says that's the irony of this whole thing well the interviewer the the, the spin doctor the other spin doctor there the other political lobbyist could go that that isn't an irony because what you're saying is just factually incorrect i know this as a psych psychologist i know this as a social scientist it isn't factually correct but he doesn't he doesn't stop him he's allowing this person to throw a hand grenade into tv land um as the whole of uh the christian right america watches this and goes damn it's come out of the mouth of one of the greatest most legendary psychopaths ever that we america is under threat right now clear and present danger through our tv sets the interviewer, the interviewer doesn't stop that. And I am disgusted by that. Bundy is terrible, but that's not good either. It's really not good either. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? Yeah, he scooches right past the full punishment thing. Just glides right by it, doesn't go in and say, and I agree, you, you, you guys have covered everything on this, but um, 
the at, at that point though the interviewer should have come back in and said hey man wait a minute what about the let's talk about this one more time that wasn't the, the answer to the question i asked you didn't didn't really get his answer on that so i'm not going to add to all that is that everybody no nope, me okay go ahead greg what do you got yeah so I, a little bit of stuff here there's outright arrogance as he responds to this i mean mark i agree that disdain that's arrogance that's like you you lowly peons and then i think there's narcissism in what he's accomplished he doesn't talk about other serial killers as if they are somebody he talks about them as living up to his mark that they're going to be more of him and i think there's some of that from him and he, he even says you need to protect people you need to protect them from people like me and he does a lip compression then he turns and he does it's all your fault it's dead on you guys created the werewolf and you're piping it into your homes you deserve what you get he does a whole blame sharing thing at the end I, I think it ties back all the stuff you guys are talking about the last comment i would make is if you did not know this guy would be executed in 12 hours would you have any idea in the way he's talking psychopath psychopath great point yeah do you deserve the punishment the state has inflicted upon you? <laughs> That's a very good question. And I'll answer it very, very honestly. I, I don't want to die. I'm not going to kid you. I'll kid, kid you not. Um, I deserve certainly the, the most extreme punishment society has. And I deserve, I think society deserves to be protected from me and from others like me, that's for sure. Um, I think what I, what I hope will come of our discussion is I think society deserves to be protected from itself because, because of we, as, as we've been talking, there are, there are forces that loose in, in, in this country, particularly, again, uh, this kind of violent pornography, uh, where on the one hand, well-meaning, decent people will condemn behavior of a Ted Bundy while they're walking past a, a, a magazine rack full of the very kinds of things that send young kids down the road to be Ted Bundys. That's the irony. We're talking here not just about more. We're talking, I'm, what I'm talking about is going beyond retribution, which is what people want with me, going beyond retribution and punishment, because there is no way in the world that killing me is going to restore uh, those beautiful children to their parents and, and, and correct and, 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 and soothe the pain. But I'll tell you, there are lots of other kids playing in streets around this country today who, who are going to be dead tomorrow and the next day and the next day and next month because other young people are reading the kinds of things and seeing the kinds of things that are available in the media today. Ted, as you would imagine, there's tremendous cynicism about you on the outside, and I suppose for good reason. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that there's anything that you could say that people would uh, would believe, some people would believe. Yeah. And, uh, and yet, you told me last night, and I have heard this through our mutual friend John Tanner, that you have uh, accepted the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and uh, are a follower and a believer in him. Do you draw strength from that uh, as you approach these final hours? I do. I can't say that uh, it's going to be being easy. in the, the, the valley of the shadow of death is, is something that I've become all that accustomed to and that I'm, you know, and that I'm strong and uh, uh, nothing's bothering me. Uh, listen, it's no fun. It's, mm -hmm. it's it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it gets kind of lonely, and yet I have to remind myself that every one of us uh, will go through this someday yes. in one way or another, so and, and, man. and countless uh, millions who have walked this earth before us have. So this is just an experience which we all share. And, yeah. All right. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I don't have a whole lot on this one. He's got all the dedication and all the, the faith of Homer Simpson in The Simpsons when he's praying to Jeebus. I mean, this guy, I don't have any belief that he is, I think he's doing the right thing for his audience and that's what he's after. That's all I see. I don't see any real pain, any real suffering, any real emotion. And that's what we always say is these guys are that. The guys, if you happen to have been diagnosed as a psychopath, we're not saying you are a monster. We're saying this guy 
was a monster. He got cured, but this guy was a monster. He turned into one of the worst possible people on earth and was executed for it. Chase, what do you got? <laughs> he, he did get cured. <laughs> so when the, when the interviewer here, Dr. Dobson, uh, Dr. Dobson, I'll just do that, uh, <laughs> says mutual friend. He's assuming some kind of relationship with this person and assuming some kind of uh, co-relatedness, some community with this person, uh, with Ted. And it's disgusting to me. I'm disgusted uh, just that he would even try to do this to push a narrative. I'm going to make friends with and pretend friends with a psychopath. Mutual friends suggests that they are friends. So horrible. And right here, I just want to focus in really tightly on one line of speech when he says, listen, it was no fun. I was lonely. When he says, listen, that triggers us as interviewers to start using auditory language. I hear what you're saying. That sounds good to me. That, that guy had really loud clothing on. We're using some kind of auditory language. When he says it was no fun, he describes everything in all of his interviews as fun or not fun killing was fun for him so i'm going to use that phrase as a, a person talk to him in an interview finally when he says lonely i know that he's a socially driven person i'm definitely 100 percent going to be using the loneliness social connectedness example to get this guy to confess scott yeah i now again hear me out or y'all are going to turn on me here when he starts talking, let me say this first. Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. And that's where I sit on in, in this situation. When he starts bringing in Jesus and saying, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your savior and all that, like everything is going to be okay for this guy now, and we should forgive him too, and that's going to be okay. This guy's a monster. In my opinion, when I, even if you are forgiven for things like that, there's no, you have to be a human to be forgiven for those things. I don't think there's anybody in there. And I think that when that gets taken care of, when it's all open and there's judgment day, I think when you show up up there, they go, oh yeah, you're forgiven. Well, let's talk about these girls over here. Let's, let's talk about that for a while. I think, I don't know, man, that's, it's just such a, just such a, um, he shouldn't have walked down that path with this guy. I don't think he shouldn't have done that because he's making it look like it's okay. And he's going to be just fine. It's bringing a happy ending to this. And it's not a happy ending for anybody in this, except for like Greg was saying, except for his being cured. So outside of that, I don't think it, I don't think there's anything good in that. I shouldn't say all that stuff. Somebody's going to take it wrong and I'll get in trouble, but sure. I don't care. Scott, Scott's church. To YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But anyway, so you know what I'm saying? I'm, me and Big Guns are tight, man. He loves me. And we get along great. His dad loves me. So we get along great. And he loves you, but I'm his favorite. So let's make sure we get that straight when I'm telling you about all that stuff. I think they've got something worked out for these guys who do stuff like this. Even though they get forgiven, I think something's still up for that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, uh, so I had the same chase in that I put, put here... Um, now they now they have mutual friends. It's like I can't believe it. It's like wow, you're gonna do that? Like you're gonna say that you are a friend with Ted Bundy for your political agenda? That is off. I mean, I know people in politics who will do whatever it takes. But this is like beyond anything that I've seen in a lobbyist going, yeah, I'll just make, I'll say I'm friends with Ted Bundy for this one. If we can stop that filth coming down cable TV and make America scared again, like, let's do it. It's like, you, like, Dobson, my hat is off to you. I know some people will do some stuff, but you are, you take the biscuit, I tell you. Um, well, so what happens is, is Bundy runs with that one. <laughs> he, he runs with it and he goes, I love his image of, I've not experienced being in the shadow of death. No, because you are the thing that blocks out the sunlight and casts that shadow. You've never been in that valley in the darkness. You are the monolith that stops the light that the people have looked up to in horror as that darkness has come over them. So incredible image there from my point of view and then he shifts it to well i've never experienced that but 
we all are going to experience that moment of death. And basically he says, we are all Ted Bundy in death. I mean, again, like if you, that, that is a speech writer because he's managed to bring us all together under one uh, agenda. <laughs> I mean, genius. Anyway, I put here, I'm speechless at the end of this. Let's power up the generators. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Ted, as you would imagine, there's tremendous cynicism about you on the outside, and I suppose for good reason. Uh, I'm not sure that there's anything that you could say that people would uh, would believe, some people would believe. Yeah. And, uh, and yet, you told me last night, and I have heard this through our mutual friend John Tanner, that you have uh, accepted the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and uh, are a follower and a believer in him. Do you draw strength from that uh, as you approach these final hours? I do. I can't say that uh, it's going to be being easy. in the, the, the valley of the shadow of death is, is something that I've become all that accustomed to and that I'm, you know, and that I'm strong and uh, uh, nothing's bothering me. Uh, listen, it's no fun. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it gets kind of lonely. And yet, I have to remind myself that every one of us uh, will go through this someday yes. in one way or another. So and, under man. and countless uh, millions who have walked this earth before us have. So this is just an experience which we all share. And, yeah. All right. all right. Well, let's throw around the room and talk about what we think we've seen here. And in 30 seconds or less, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I, I, I didn't know what I was going to get with Bundy. Never seen him before. Had a bit of an understanding of his legend. Never seen him on, on TV being interviewed. I expected something of what I saw there. I never expected Dobson. So it's been fantastic for me because I just didn't expect to see that. That was a lesson for me. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, this was a person being fake with a person helping them be fake so that they could be more fake to help the other person be more fake so that they could sell more fake to human beings. It was a person passing a yo-yo back and forth with more spin being put on it back and forth. <laughs> I'm disgusted more by the interviewer than I am, than I am with uh, Bundy, Greg. Yeah, guys, whatever the cause behind it, whatever, this is one of those rare chances for us to see a psychopath being a psychopath. Not being able to show emotion, but being able to work and do everything that you need to get across the message that they think you want to hear so they can get you to wherever they need you to be. Now, does that mean all psychopaths are violent killers? No, there are lots of people who have psychopathy who live normal lives. But these serial killers use all of those same skills to lure people in. This guy was all kinds of sick. There was all kinds of things wrong with him. He confessed to 30 murders, who knows how many others, and God knows what else he did to people along the way. This is a, a horrible end to a horrible situation, but he's gone. That's a good thing. I think there's a value to you watching this video and learning how people work you. Because if you project onto them goodness and light, you're going to get it reflected right back at you using your words. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. I think it's a great example of being able to watch a psycho, like you just said, watch a psychopath be a psychopath. It's like putting one in a jar and just sitting there and watching it for a while and see what, and putting, you're right, it's the spider and the fly situation. Just putting them both in a jar and seeing what happens. And that's what happens. It was excellent. It was a great study, I think, a great study. And I think no matter where Ted Bundy is right now, you know, what it, what did happen to him in the, in the end, you know, he, we knew he, he's he's gone now, but I'm sure he's looking up at us right now and saying, hey, Behavior panel, you nailed it. Datus. You know what yeah. What I meant a, a second ago? I just want to clarify. One of them didn't have a choice whether or not to feel any emotion, and the other one did. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Excellent. All right, fellas, I think this is a good one. We'll see you next time. See you. Subscribe. Please. Please. <laughs> <laughs> The oh man i mean dude he would well we'll talk about the oh well the, yeah. the sad truth is they probably should have gone <laughs> scott what? please save that please save well, that well, i've got it i've got it it's going i'll put it at the end of the thing it's what he deserves so what do you got
Não vai receber, não. Você não sei se